Good morning. Um, we are moving towards the end of the Baroque era, and right now I'm talking about the high Baroque classicism. I have a really interesting question because it's always interesting when somebody is new to the class that they have these very basic but very good question that I'm so I'm so used to the material that I sometimes forget about explaining a few things. Uh, most of the period uh, like Renaissance or Baroque that lasted for over a century, uh, I separated what you call early Renaissance or early Baroque, uh, high Renaissance. And in once we talk about high is literally when the artists are kind of synthesizing what happened before. Uh, so for the Renaissance, we know that in the early Renaissance, they invent, I mean, they, they mathematized, if you want, um, mathematized or whatever, the um, perspective. And suddenly this, oh, perspective, this is great. And if you know Uccello uh, and many others started working on, on the perspective, but it was artificial when you looked at their paintings. This was all kind of harmonized by Leonardo da Vinci, by Michelangelo, and by Raphael, and many others, by the way. But these are the three big names. And so we call the high Renaissance is when all these became so natural that you're not even aware of it. But you look at it and say, oh, wow, that the, the, the space is so natural because they've really worked on the perspective. Same thing with the Baroque is once we know we have different trends in the Baroque. If you remember, we have Caravaggio with his tenebrism, but we also have the Cahachi family with a more classical approach to the Baroque where they add more energy. Everything is more alive than it was during the Renaissance. Um, and so once we come to the high Baroque, it's in fact, we have had two, one or two generation of artists. They, they're looking back and they say, oh, I like this and I like that. And they pick up a little bit of everything and put it all together. But even there, as we have for the, the high Baroque, we have seen the incredible frescoes of Cortona last time that are exuberant, they are just filled with figures that all, if you remember, are very symbolic of different uh, abstract ideas. But then there is a reaction to Cortona with uh, Andrea Zaki that we're going to see today uh, that is, wants things to be much uh, quieter and uh, not to put as many figures because they think that then people are not even able to recognize who is who because there are so many. And he's also going to uh, go away, step away from the idea of the Soto in Su, the idea that you see the figures elevating. He's going to do very much what Karachi was doing before with what is called the Quadro Riportato, where you have a feeling of seeing just an easel painting stuck on, on the ceiling with figures that are a narration that you can look at. You don't have the feeling they're going to go through the roof. And so uh, these are these two trends. And these two trends are going to lead to very different trends at the end of the Baroque and into the 18th century. And we'll talk about that. So um, also what we find with Zaki is that he finds his source in uh, poetry. Uh, that was the big term at that time, ut pictura poesis, as his painting. So his poetry uh, that looks at his work as it should be read as a tragedy or a poem. So let's look at the first figure, Andrea Zaki, uh, born in Rome in 1599. Uh, he started his um, apprenticeship in the studio of the Cavaliere d'Arpino, which uh, gives you an idea, if you remember the Cavaliere d'Arpino, was the one where Caravaggio started too. 
And so Cavalier had Arpino, who was kind of backward. He didn't really evolve into the Baroque uh, period, but he was a very good theoretical uh, teacher. Uh, he studied the paintings of Raphael, whose influence is going to be very apparent in what he shows. Uh, and literally, they were. He was a member of the Academia di San Luca, as well as Cortona was, and they debated on the floor of the academy uh, on each of their positions. So, as I mentioned before, Cortona uh, was for that exuberance of number of people. We're going to see one more figure of uh, one more image of what he was doing. And then on the other side, we have Zaki who says, you know, this is not the way it should be. Um, it should be much uh, quieter, less figures. So each figure that is represented is really valorized in the eyes of the, the beholder. He also disdained the low or genre subjects and themes, uh, which means uh, still lifes, for example, and even um, landscapes. He only, his aspiration was really a history painting because that was always at the top of the hierarchy. And he thought that the high art, there was the difference between high art and low art, should focus on exalted themes, biblical, mythological, or from classical ancient history. And he died in the Lazio, so very close to Rome in 1661. I'm bringing back one of the images that you've already seen of the Palazzo Barberini, which played an incredible role during the Baroque period, that enormous palace that was built for the Barberini family uh, was originally the Palazzo Sforza, uh, was purchased by the Barberini in 1625. And then they purchased all the land around and I had shown you last time, uh, quite interesting, map showing that you have that huge palace that looks tiny along the huge land that was around with gardens and, and orchards and, and medicinal gardens and everything. We also see that there, because of the size of the palace and you imagine the construction, we have three main architects that succeeded one another into building this. And we have big names, Moderno, who was in charge of finishing St. Peter, finished the facade, Bernini, I don't even have to mention, sculptor and architect, and Bohomini, mostly architect. Three of them worked successively uh, on that palace. And literally, the palace became one of the example of Baroque decoration, though it is a rather classical building from the outside. Inside, the, the decoration is absolutely incredible. So this is an example of the decoration by Zaki, not the paintings that are on the walls, but the ceilings and, the, and just the above the, the top of the wall. Uh, this, this is uh, one of the main salon of Anna Colonna, who was part of the Barberini family at that time and had an entire wing of the palace. And so there again, you can see that that incredible difference between Cortona's work and Zaki. Here I have them side by side. You can appreciate how this is the work within the Palazzo Barberini, by the way, of the triumph of divine providence, but also with the presence of the Barberini uh, coat of arm. Uh, that, of course, is in the, the biggest salon that takes two floors of the, of the palace and that incredible ceiling that makes you almost dizzy looking at it, but it's done in that new style of Cortona with the, the, all the figures giving you the feeling they are kind of flying up and going to end up through the ceiling towards the, uh, to the heavens. Now, compared to that, we have that much quieter representation by Zaki uh, of uh, different uh, gods, uh, Greek gods and a few cherubs frolicking around the figures.
the, the biggest uh, fresco that he did is the Divine Wisdom. Uh, you have, uh, this is also in the apartment of Anna Colonna that's in the hallway in the north wing of the Palazzo. And it represents a triumph of divine uh, wisdom. Uh, this was the first commission that was given uh, in 1629, 1629 of the largest room of that wing. And so what you, you find, you have uh, divine wisdom, which is who is enthroned. And then in the corners there, you have uh, some uh, mermaids that are carrying a representation of the sun. And then a few other figures, and I'm going to bring their names so you can identify them. Again, we are talking about the, the uh, iconologia of uh, Cesare Ripa, who gives you an idea of how you have to represent uh, the figures and what uh, paraphernalia they're using. So we have from uh, right to left, we have here uh, beauty, we have, if I can read with my dirty uh, perspicacity uh, next to it and then we have purity on top um, love on the upper part here so just each figures and literate people uh, very highly educated people would be aware who these figures were where there was no little panel as you find in museum now explaining all that, but they were very much aware that that kind of figure would represent love. That one would be charity or things like that. So what you can see as a difference is that there is no uh, temple architecture all around. All you see there is a fresco. So he's not trying to fool your eye with fake architecture. Uh, it's just a plain fresco. So uh, with the divine wisdom and then around her, we have a few bees that are, as you know, the part of the um, coat of arms of uh, Barberini. And then beautiful cloud formation and the huge radiating solar disk in yellow gold. Now, what is interesting too, why so much emphasis on the sun, um, the, there was that belief that because of the favorable conjunction of the stars at two key moments, Urban VIII's birth and his election later on, the were born and elect following the stars extremely closely and uh, had some uh, literally magi, magi that would uh, advise them. So very interesting to see the cardinals and so on that were quite paying a lot of attention to astrology. He painted also some uh, easel painting. Here we have the vision of St. Romuald. And you can see how very classical his representation are. Uh, and that's literally going to lead to the neoclassical art of Anton Mengs. Uh, this is really the predecessor of what Anton Mengs, who is going to be the promoter of neoclassical art in, at the end of the uh, 18th century. He is concentrated on, on decorum and he's uh, really uh, showing the movements in a rhetorical fashion, but rather muted. There's nothing excessive with Zaki. Actually, at that time, because probably his way of painting is easier than the one of Cortona. He did win a lot of uh, support and even took over some of the, the pupils of Cortona. Ken, yes. If I may ask, I don't see the connection between these two things, but they are 140 years. Yeah, they, they, the Mengs is really starting uh, at the end of the 18th century. But Mengs is coming to Italy and he's going to look at what has been done. And uh, he uh, 
uh, Mengs is going to be very much um, a very close friend of Winkelmann, Winkelmann being the father of archaeology who went to Naples and um, under the order of the, the Spanish king is going to uh, catalog and um, make sense of all the discoveries in Pompeii and Herculaneum. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be the trigger to the neoclassical movement, but you still have to find a way of painting. And for him, Zaki was much more an example than Cortona, which was so different. Does that answer your yeah. question? Okay. And then we see uh, also two other figures, uh, Nicolas Poussin, who is also a very classical painter, a French painter that came to Rome and spent most of his career in Rome. And then compared to uh, the Guido, Guido Reni, who is a follower of, of the, the earlier uh, Baroque painters. And as you can see, it's many more figures and it's much more energetic. So these are two different kinds of um, trends that we find at that time. Now, on the other hand, here is, I bring back one of the fresco by Cortona of the Golden Age. He is going to be the initiator of the Rococo movement. As you know, Rococo movement that started with, in Italy with Cepolo and a few others. And then in France, we have the whole uh, series of Fragonard and Boucher and so on. Uh, his very um, pretty style, if you want, that, that really emphasizes the pastoral way and many figures and uh, is going to be very much the example for Cepolo later on. And I'll just give you one of the examples of uh, Rinaldo, enchanted by Armido. As you can see, women have the same type. And so again, so we see the Zaki side is going to be the initiator to the neoclassical way of painting. And then uh, Cortona, on the other hand, is going to be a very good example and source of inspiration for the Chiapolos and uh, in France, Boucher and so on. So really interesting to see how these branch out. Another artist of the time is Alessandro Algardi, and we have already uh, talked about him, uh, comparing, uh, comparing his works with the ones of um, Bernini. Uh, he was born in Bologna in 98 was apprenticed uh, with Agostino Carracci up there uh, in his uh, very famous school. Uh, and then because he seemed to like sculpting better than painting, went, went on to study with Conventi. By 1625, he went to Rome and became uh, one of the artists working for the Ludovisi family. Uh, he was asked to uh, made to uh, sculpt and design and sculpt the tomb of Leo XI, who was a Medici, and then uh, came fortunately for him under the patronage of the Pamphili family in 1644. He actually met Velasquez in 1650 during one of the two trips of Velasquez to Italy, and died in Rome in 1654. He was a great sculptor. And probably why we don't know his name as much is because he is a contemporary of Bernini, who was such a huge, huge favorite uh, of the time. And so you, uh, I showed you before that, this is the famous monument of uh, Pope Leo XI, the extraordinary monument when you look at it, very beautiful, but he had as a rival, Bernini and who did uh, had done actually did it at about the same time the tomb of Urban the Eight and it's very different whereas Algardi is rather classical in his composition we see look at the just the position with Bernini is much more um, 
in in movement it's, it's always bernini picks the the time as you know the, with the most tension in the figure and even we'll see some uh some comparison with the face of urban the eight and leo the eleven uh, a, a great sense of feeling in um urban the eight of course who was a great friend of bernini and here you can see both with a, a kind of a power that exudes from Bernini, but a most beautiful representation of Leo XI by Algardi. He did also this low relief. This is the meeting of Pope Leo I and Attila. Um, of course, that's old story that was uh, sculpted in marble it, uh, in 1634 to 44 and is in the Basilic, uh, Basilica of San Pietro and uh, the Vatican. Uh, this is always an interesting story because uh, the, that meeting was supposed to be very instrumental in stopping Attila, who was as at that time ravaging the eastern part of Europe. And uh, for him coming and meeting that barbarian uh, Attila uh, and stopping him was quite uh, incredible. It's there he finds in his uh, inspiration with Raphael, the fresco in the Vatican with the same subject. So the Emperor Valentinian uh, sister was Honoria, who in order to escape her forced betrothal betrothal to a Roman senator had sent the Hunnish king a plea for help and her engagement ring in the spring of 450. Though Honoria may not have intended the proposal of marriage, Attila chose to interpret the message as such, and I think I would have too. Um, he accepted asking for half of the Western empire as a dowry. When Valentinian discovered the plan, only the influence of his mother, Gala Placidia, convinced him to exile. And you know the beautiful little tomb of Gala Placidia in Ravenna. It's the same lady. So convinced him to exile rather than kill Honoria. He also wrote to Attila strenuously denying the legitimacy of the supposed marriage proposal. Attila was not convinced and sent an emissary to Ravenna to proclaim that Honoria was innocent and that the proposal had been legitimate and that he would come to claim what was rightfully his. He returned in 452 to claim his marriage to Honor, uh, Honoria again and invaded and ravaged Italy all along the way. The city of Venice was, by the way, founded as a result of these attacks. People took refuge on these small islands and then later on expanded on them. <coughs> Attila's army sacked a, a number of absolutely beautiful uh, cities such as Aquileia, literally raised them. And that's finally, uh, at the wish of the Emperor Valentinian, Pope Leo I, accompanied by the count, by some councils and some uh, army, met Attila at Mincio, uh, close to Mantua and obtained from him the promise he would withdraw from Italy and negotiate peace with the emperor. I wish it was so easy. Could we find another pope to talk to Putin? Maybe. The later anonymous account is, uh, so the, this is exactly what happened. And so it was considered almost as a miracle. <coughs> He also sculpted some uh, portrait bust. This is, I think, just beautiful of Olympia Pamphili, who <coughs> was married to a Pamphili, a very strong woman, was apparently quite influential on the Pope Innocent, who was a Pamphili. And is he represents, this is a terracotta, so a project for the, um, marble bust that exists at the Vatican. He also made uh, some portrait bust of uh, Innocent X, uh, 
Um, as I mentioned to you before, Innocent the Ten was considered as extremely ugly, so much so that people were wondering how he could ever have been elected Pope. Uh, the bust is made of uh, porphyry and bronze trimming. No, it is definitely slightly idealized, but interesting again, because uh, Bernini was also asked to make a portrait bust. And so you can compare both and see, by the way, what the difference is in using that porphyry and bronze compared to just uh, simple marble. And I find that that dark face is really not complementary to the to to the Pope in the Sunday tense that marble makes him slightly gentler. But very interesting to to see the difference in style and, and just a little notice. Look at the way the, the buttons are put on that uh, top of his uh, garment. Some of the buttons are not quite pushed through. And this shows again that immediacy of Bernini, who is uh, always plays with these things to make them so real. But a wonderful representation by Algardi. And again, as I say, sometimes you have these great artists, but are born at the time where there are some even greater artists, and then are kind of put aside and uh, forgotten most of the time. And now I'm bringing an artist who is from my country, Francesco Duquesnois, known as Francois Duquesnois in Belgium, born in Brussels in 1597, son of Jérôme Duquesnois Sr. and brother of Jérôme Jr. Uh, he arrives in 1618 uh, in Rome and studies classical sculpture. He's a very talented uh, sculptor meets Poussin in 1624 and collaborated as did Borromini uh, with Bernini for the Baldacchino. And he sculpted a lot of the, the marginal figures that are part of the Baldacchino. But of course, as we know, never recognized officially when the Baldacchino was over, the only name on it was Bernini. He just Sidestep, and that was made, and that made many of these artists very angry. And he died in Rome from gout or concussion. He had fallen off a scaffolder uh, a few days before uh, in 1643. He was only 46 years old. Uh, and he was actually he'd been asked to go to Paris to work for Louis XIV. And uh, he died just before uh, he could embark into the ship. Before I show you his works, I have to show a work that was made by his father. And this is the little mannequin piece statue that you can find in Brussels. For those of you that went to uh, Brussels, it's considered one of the treasures uh, that you can find at the corner of a very small street in the center of Brussels of a little guy. Uh, making it easy <laughs> and uh, but it's an adorable this statue that has become extremely symbolic of um, the Brussels spirit if you want and it has it is accompanied by lots of legend that explain what happens so you have one thing is that he was one legend that dates back to 1142 uh, where uh, the troops of uh, a lord were battling against a troop of another uh, family. And uh, the troops put the, the little boy in a basket and hung it in the tree to encourage them. And from there, he urinated on the troops of the other camp who eventually lost the battle. So that's one of the story. The other story is that he would use his instrument to go and uh, uh, stop the fires that had been started by the Spaniards in Brussels. So they had lots of little legends, but he's become really legendary by himself, uh, has a whole room in the uh, Maison du Roi in the, on the Grand Square, the Grand Place in Brussels, with old costumes that have been offered by uh, people all over the world including baseball uniforms from the United States and then 
uh, all kind of um, ethnic costumes from everywhere. So very known little boy, but that's his father. He's a much more serious person and did uh, many sculptures, including uh, the statue of Santa Susana, which is about two meter high for the Basilica of Loreto, where the, the church, the, the house of Mary is supposed to have been transported. Um, and that was part of a, a complete program of renewal of the Basilica at that time. Again, it's very classical when you, you see it, but also an observation of nature. Part of the decoration of uh, St. Peter, he was asked to do one of the four sculptures that are uh, decorating the niches around the crossing at St. Peter. There are four huge statues there. These are four and a half meter high. Uh, that were, were sculpted and by a very uh, known sculptor of the time, including uh, Bernini himself. And so he was asked to do the St. Andrew uh, sculpture. And I compare it to the Longinus in the same location, so in a different niche by Bernini. And again, there, what we find is that that integration of Bernini's uh, um, statue of Longinus is extremely well integrated in them, which ways the uh, St. Andrew is a little bit of, of proportion, if you want, compared to uh, the other one, but extremely beautiful sculptor. He was a great, great artist. Uh, also, he did some, some of these uh, beautiful low relief. Here is the victory of sacred over profane love. And that, that looks almost that it's, uh, he's looking at Donatello almost in the way that he uh, sculpts with these beautiful little cherubs all around. But very, very classical. As I mentioned, he died much too young at 46 at the peak of his career. Now I'm bringing you to the, the third uh, artist architecture. And uh, let's look at uh, Carlo Rinaldi. We talked already about him because he did participate again. Once we talk about architecture, we have to realize how long it takes to build. And therefore we have often generations of architects that are succeeding one another to finish a building. So uh, Carlo Rinaldi was born in Rome and was one of the leading architects of the 17th century, uh, known for the grandeur of his uh, design. But again, he is facing uh, Bernini, he's facing Borromini, he's facing Cortona. So he's only one of them. And he died in Rome. He spent his uh, life in, in Rome. So here's uh, one of the uh, works he did with, uh, together with Carlo Maderno, who was the generation before, uh, the San Andrea della Valle. Uh, very beautiful two stories. Uh, church with the orders. We have the <coughs> Corinthian, uh, Corinthian column at the bottom. You can see the capitals there. And then we go to Ionic, which is very typical where they, they change the order of the columns. When we talk about the orders, we talk about Dorian, uh, Ionic, and Corinthian. So with the pediment, very classical double pediment. And, uh, but as you can see, not uh, as we had seen with Cortona, uh, nor of course Bohomini, no articulation of the facade. It's a flat surface with columns and pediments. He is also one of the many uh, architects that worked on the San Agnese on the, the uh, Piazza Navona. 
uh, these again uh, work. He is the one who finished it and slightly changed the design of Bohomini, who wanted a, a rather majestic staircase that goes in and so on. And this has become much more muted. And he uh, changed the height of these uh, bell towers on either side. He's also the one who designed uh, at the Piazza del Popolo, the two twin church of uh, Santa Maria di Monte Santo and Santa Maria de Miracoli. Uh, that are these uh, two churches on Piazza del Popolo, uh, which are um, showing the, that kind of trident of streets with the uh, Via del Babuino, Villa, Via del Villa, sorry, Via del Corso and Via de Ripetta. And of course, the, the big obelisk in the very middle. The origin of the two churches date back to the 17th century and were restored as the main entrance at that time to the Middle Age and the Renaissance from the Via Flaminia. <clears throat> but then they decide to uh, enhance the design because it was such an important location. And this is uh, the result. So uh, from up front, you have the feeling they're really twin churches, but in fact, one is substantially bigger than the other. And you can see that, uh, <clears throat> that the facade is the same with that pediment again and uh, a, a slight narthex. So, with uh, four, uh, two pairs of uh, uh, two pairs of two columns. The belfry was added, by the way, in the 18th century. But probably the most interesting of the architects after Borromini is Baldassare Longhena. Uh, he is a Venetian, so we're moving away from Rome now. Go back to Venice. He was born in Venice in 1598. You see how many of these are born in 1598-97? They're all about the same uh, birthday. Uh, he studied under the architect Vincenzo Scamozzi, uh, designed the Chioggia Cathedral that I'm not going to show you because it has uh, been very much damaged and rebuilt in um, exterior, uh, the exterior, a uh, much more modern style. And then 1631, he was given the great commission of a, a work that you all know, which is the Santa Maria della Salute in Venice, that very iconic church on the Grand Canal. And he died in Venice in 1682. Um, he, at the death of Scamozzi, he went on uh, finishing the work here of the Procurazie Nuove. Uh, this is the part of, this is the Piazza San Marco. And uh, the old part, the Vecchia, Procurazie Vecchia, uh, was the building where uh, all the administrators of the treasury of um, Venice were working. And just to make it easy for them, they built that other part across, which is the Principatie Nuova where they had their apartments. And so this building was all made of apartments and then little stores at the bottom, which was usual. You had stores at the bottom because that was, the, the, the ground floor was never considered as a very good one for living because of the floods already. Is the slide changer? Oh, so sorry. There you are, thank you. Um, so here you can see this is St. Mark, this is the Doge Palace. Here you have the Procurazie Vecchia, and here the Nuova. And then what is at the end was built under the Napoleon uh, part, and is the Procurazie Nuovissima, the very uh, new one. So uh, this was designed by Scamozzi, and then they didn't like because he had added one uh, story to the building, and it was two deck two heavily decorated. And so there was about four architects in between that work on it. And then finally, when Scamozzi died, uh, Longena took over and took down a lot of the decoration that uh, Scamozzi had designed. 
But his great work is, of course, the Santa Maria de la Salute that you're all familiar with, because when you are coming out of the, if you take a gondola from the Piazza San Marco and you turn into the Grand Canal, that's the one church that you see there. And it's an absolutely beautiful sight. Uh, so the, the story of the Basilica di Santa Maria de, de la Salute, um, which is mostly known as La Salute, uh, probably one of the most famous church after San Marco in Venice, um, goes back to the summer of 1629 when a wave of plague uh, assaulted Venice, literally. And for the over the next two years killed nearly a third of the population in Venice. Uh, as it was done at that time, they had no idea, don't forget, they had no idea how the plague came about. That was only identified at the end of the 19th century. So they had no idea it was uh, um, brought by the rats and, and what they were wearing, the lies. Uh, that they had on them. So um, they were trying all the display of the sacrament. They were doing prayers and processions. Uh, they actually uh, went to the church that were in existence, like San Rocco and San Lorenzo Giustiniani, uh, that, was that were supposed to be protector against the plague. And so finally, they decided uh, to uh, to dedicate a new church to be protected of the plague by the Virgin Mary this time. And this has remained something very um, alive because every single year, the Venetians have a procession all the way to the church as a commemoration of that time. And so they made a big contest, 11 submissions, uh, and uh, Baldassare Longena was selected to design the church that was finally completed in 1681, the year before he died. Just for your pleasure, I show you one of the uh, beautiful paintings by Turner of the Dogana and Santa Maria de la Salute. So the Dogana being the huge bar bar barge that was used by the Doge at that time to be transported. And this was an incredible, the Dogana was an incredibly uh, gorgeous uh, barge with gold and everything you could imagine. And then that would go into a procession to uh, La Salute. Here's a view, as you can see, it's not a large church. It's very imposing from the facade, but the church itself has, is very, uh, compact. It's actually an uh, octagonal church. It's really squeezed between the, the houses there. And uh, what we find is that he's looking, Longena is looking at different plants. He's looking at the Byzantine plant, such as the one of San Vitale in Ravenna, which is also that octagon. But for the facade, he's looking at the work of Palladio. And of course, not far from the Salute is the famous San Giorgio Maggiore on another, you know, on the island a little bit uh, further uh, east. And uh, he's definitely looking at the facade of San Giorgio Maggiore, as you can see, which is almost replicated here with the pediment, the pair of uh, columns with very high pedestal, as you can see, this, the base of the column is huge, and the same thing he's using there. But of course, the rest is very different, and he's going to articulate it in a very different way. Here is the plan. So you, you find that the octagon, and then here at the end is where the, uh, this is the entrance, and the high altar is going to be there and different chapels, of course. So he was facing a problem is that if he wanted to keep the octagonal shape outside, 
and to keep a clear design inside, uh, he had to, to insert two consecutive pillars parallel to each other uh, so that when you were in the center, you had always a perfect vision. And probably it's the dome and its surrounding that is the most typical of the Salute, these huge, these giant scrolls that are in fact the buttresses to the, the drum of the, uh, the, of the dome. And then of course the lantern, which provides the, the light to the, the center of the, the church. And then the whole statuary, which is a new thing for uh, these type of churches. The interior is quite spectacular. Uh, probably, I think, for the floor. Don't ever forget to look at the floors in these churches because they are magnificent. And they give you such a, a replication of the, the design of the church itself. It, it's a marvelous work. And then you have the main altar there. And very light because you have windows in each of the chapels that really inundate the, the uh, church with light and as you can see at the drum just uh, under the dome you also have a whole series of windows here's the main altar quite dramatic and probably almost the only really coloristic part of the, of the, the church which is very much he tries to make it very simple in that kind of gray and white and whitewashing the, the walls. And if I ask a question, yes. when you look at this floor, and yes. the style, but what the tiles? Marble, the marble, yeah. Yeah, marble. Yeah. Oh. They are marble of different colors. That was really an industry at the time. They were specialists that would do this floor. That goes back to even prior to the Renaissance. It's almost an inheritance of the mosaic, but becomes something that is based in philosophy, in um, showing these uh, three-dimensional designs are very typical. That's why I say never forget to look at the floors. Sometimes they've been removed, but when you have the original floors, they are extraordinary. And really go back, as I say, it's an old industry at the time. And here is, as you can see, that, that whole series of, of uh, windows that, that are just making up the drum that supports the dome. So it's a very, very light church when you get in. You don't have the feeling of, of darkness and mystery. It, it's extremely, uh, it's there. And then again, every other uh, angle you have a statue decorating it. He was also asked to decorate, to build some of the main uh, houses on the Grand Canal, uh, the Cha Hezonico, Cazzo, not Cha, Cazzo Hezonico. Um, this is at the right bank of the canal at the point where it's joined by the Rio di San Barnaba. Uh, it was previously occupied by two houses belonging to the Bon family, one of the patrician family in Venice. Um, and so he's at that time decided to build a large palazzo on the site. Uh, three story marble facade facing the canal. The ground floor is rusticated, just as the Medici palace in, in Florence and the um, PT Palace also. And of course, it's normal. Don't forget that uh, first floor, the ground floor in Venice is to let the, the barges in. So you would literally go uh, prior to, now it's not the case anymore, but you would go into there and unload the things that you had in the barge. And that would go to the Piano Nobile which was the second floor where you had all the reception room and then you had uh, bedrooms on the, the upper floor. But the, that floor here was purely, uh, you probably had the kitchens there and so on, but it was not nothing uh, for the, the, the guests to see.
here you have an idea of the plan. So you had on the, do you have to look at the upper floor then uh, with the ballroom? Just a beautiful house here. You have an idea of the interior. This is the ground floor, but that has been enhanced since. But the beautiful staircase that takes you to the Piano Nobile. He's also uh, been asked to do the Cape Sajo, other, which is now the modern art museum in uh, Venice. So I can't show you the inside because it has been completely modified. But you have again that feeling of rustication at the, the ground floor, but use of beautiful arches and columns on the upper part. Just a question, I've never been there, but uh, if you go there today, how do you enter? You have to get a gondola to enter? Or but you, you, you will there? access it from the other side. On the other side. So that gives you a little idea. Next time we're going to go to Versailles and prior to go to Versailles, we'll show just a few paintings of that same uh, high Baroque period. Uh, and, uh, but we'll spend most of the time talking about the Chateau of Versailles, his history and uh, how it was decorated. And it has been by now uh, restored quite well. So let me stop this before we open the floor to questions.